Thank you. Um, thank you very much for um, coming in on a sunny day to talk about um, mental health. It's a privilege to be here. My name's Simon Blake. I'm a um, Chief Executive of Mental Health First Aid England and have been um, there for about um, nine um, months. Um, I've always worked in um, health and uh, work with young people uh, particularly. Uh, I was previously Chief Executive of the Young People's Sexual Health Charity um, Brook, which focused around um, wellbeing um, and worked at the National Union of, of Students. Um, and I'm also Deputy Chair of Stonewall, which is the um, LGBT uh, uh, charity. Um, Mental Health First Aid England is a social enterprise, a training and campaigning um, organisation that's mission um, is to uh, um, improve the mental health of the nation. Um, we are working to train um, one in ten of the adult population in um, mental health, in creating uh, a belief that mental health has to be um, addressed. And one in ten, um, I don't know if any of you have heard of um, Malcolm Gladwell's um, book, The Tipping Point, uh, which is about trying to create a cultural shift. And we believe that if you've got one in ten um, people who believe that you've absolutely got to do uh, something to ensure that mental health is promoted positively, mental health is addressed effectively, um, that people know what to do in times of, of difficulty um, or crisis, then um, we would be able to improve the mental health of the nation. So that's our, our, our mission um, and, and, and our, our purpose. Um, mental Health First Aid was first brought to um, England from Australia. It was developed in Australia uh, in 2000. Um, and then came to England in 2007. Um, um, and about um, uh, 450,000 people have been trained uh, in England um, so far, and about 4 million people um, uh, globally. And all of the evidence shows that about um, 9 out of 10 people uh, have said that once they've done the training, that understanding of mental health issues has improved in the workplace. You know, and that's the core bit about this, isn't it, that any of our learning needs to translate into action and to improve confidence to address um, an issue um, in the workplace. So I'll just tell you a little bit about mental health first aid training um, itself, um, and then I'll do uh, talk to you about the definition of mental health, which, I, um, uh, which we adopt, uh, which is the World Health Organization, just so we all know what we're um, talking about. And then I'll address the three um, specific questions which I've been asked to look at, which is <coughs> first around the impact of social media um, and technology, then about modern day stress um, in the workplace, and then about um, how we can make sure that we put mental health um, first. And then, um, as, as was said, then we'll have an opportunity for you to um, ask me questions, which hopefully I'll know the answer to some of them, and if we don't, then we can make sure that we, we find out. So a uh, mental health first aid course itself is about improving knowledge, about um, uh, ensuring that everybody has a, a basic uh, knowledge and understanding of uh, common mental health disorders. It's about also thinking about attitudes and values because clearly um, mental health, as you know, is still stigmatised and that we often learn many of those attitudes and values subconsciously or consciously. So if we're going to be um, addressing this work ourselves, we need to think about <coughs> our own frame of reference, our own experiences and our own values and belief. Um, and then also um, develops the skills and confidence. So it gives a specific um, framework about how we um, approach uh, an issue, how we listen and make sure we communicate non-judgmentally, how we ensure that we provide information and guidance, but not advice because it doesn't train us to be therapists or counsellors or, or psychiatrists, um, but then also about signposting for further information um, and support uh, and help. And, and that's really, really important just to emphasise that <coughs> you know, when we're thinking about mental health in the workplace, we don't have to have all of the knowledge, we don't have to understand everything, we're not psychiatrists, we're not therapists, but we do need to be people who know how to have good quality conversations and who know how to signpost to those people who do um, have that clinical expertise, if that's needed, or social um, support that is available. So just to make sure that we're all talking about the same thing when we're talking about mental health, um, mental health is defined as a state of well-being, um, or the World Health Organization um, defines mental health as a state of well-being in which every individual recognizes their own potential, can cope with the normal stresses of life, 
can work productively and fruitfully and is able to make a contribution to their community. The real positive dimension of mental health is stressed in whose definition of health, which is that health is a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So when we're talking about mental health, we're talking about positive mental health and well-being. Um, and, and people do tend to use language differently. Um, but um, I would be very clear when talking, uh, if we're talking about mental illness, but otherwise we're talking about that positive concept uh, of mental health. So social media um, and, uh, and technology. Um, you will know that there are lots of people who think that social media is responsible for almost everything that is bad um, in the world um, at the moment, which is what often <coughs> happens when there are new um, developments. But my own view um, is that overall social media and technology is a positive force for good. Um, it's a force for good in all sorts of ways, which we'll talk about a bit later. Um, but it is also how we use it that can be problematic. And clearly, uh, you know, there is um, an evidence base that's emerging. It's still fairly new, it's still fairly um, uh, inconclusive. But some of the things that uh, are being highlighted as potentially problematic is that people are getting, a small proportion of people are getting addicted to uh, social media uh, use. Um, and um, on that scale from real problematic use where people feel um, as though they can't um, stop uh, uh, checking uh, social media. There's also people who use it you know, at all sort of different ends of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. But what the evidence is showing is that where it becomes problematic, it can be um, where people think that it's, um, where it's causing disturbed sleep, where people are waking up in the night if they're getting notifications or if they're um, wanting to check whether they've been uh, uh, contacted or that what's happening on social media where they can find it difficult to get to sleep uh, in the first place, um, but also more importantly, where they um, just are finding it difficult to relax more generally because they're always conscious about what is happening uh, on their phones. Um, and I think you know, there, is, there is clearly a generational uh, uh, thing within this, which is that you know, whatever the generation is that goes after us, we think that the things that they do are less good um, and less moral um, than us. And actually, you know, I was with a, um, uh, my nephew who's in his teens um, fairly recently, and he genuinely believed that he had his friend in the room because they were coming in through a social media channel. Now, um, my older relatives were going, that's ridiculous. And I was going, that's really interesting. Let me, yeah, because I wouldn't experience that. But, you know, just in those generational shifts, the ways that we do things. Um, are different, and I think we have to be careful not to consider any behaviours around social media um, problematic, and to really be clear about when is it causing problems for people, rather than when is it doing something differently than I might do. And that's a, you know, a, a really important distinction, I think. What the evidence is also showing is that uh, people can be uh, generating unhelpful comparisons. We all know that comparing ourselves to um, other people um, is not good, whether it's about how well they've done at work, whether it's about what their body looks like, it's whether we imagine how much sex they're having, whether we imagine how much money they've got, whatever it is, comparisons with other people are not, um, not helpful. And social media creates the opportunity for you to compare with others even more because um, most people um, will present their best life the best parts of their life on social media rather than the fact that getting up was pretty boring, you were a bit tired, you had a shave, you had to make yourself breakfast, make your partner, your children a packed lunch or a cup of tea, whatever. Those things don't tend to make it. It's the exciting bits, the trips to the theatre, the holidays, all of those sorts of things. So this unrealistic perception of, of life um, can permeate. But again, I think we have to give people credit for understanding that that is the reality, that everybody is putting their best life on social media <laughs> rather than uh, the boring bit. So yeah, again, it's part of not just assuming it's all bad, but helping to educate people and to understand and to engage in conversations around that. There is also um, perhaps the slightly darker side of some of that, which is that there is user-generated content, which is 
and very unhelpful when it comes to mental health. Where the, you may have seen quite a lot of stuff in the press around um, content around self-harm or content around suicide. So there are clearly, again, times where there is specific bad uh, uh, and problematic information, but we mustn't confuse that with everything is problematic, and we need to be really, really clear um, about that. Just taking that one step further around the unhelpful comparisons, there's been um, a, a lot of conversation about uh, social media creates a, a FOMO, a fear of missing out, that uh, it creates a sense of, of envy um, and of jealousy, and there's quite a lot of research which is showing uh, uh, that. And clearly, um, jealousy uh, in any uh, context and in generated by anything can be um, problematic, but generating jealousy on the basis of people's, you know, the best bits of people's life is clearly something which is, is something which we need to think about and, and talk about. Um, for some people um, who experience anxiety or don't like social interaction, um, <coughs> uh, social media can substitute face-to-face uh, -face interaction, interaction um, in, in groups. Um, and you know, there is a, there's a double-edged sword to that. That can um, uh, increase loneliness if it becomes a safe place and you therefore don't want to go out and interact. But at the same time, um, it can... Uh, of course, mean that people feel more connected and more contacted with others because they are having some connection, whether that's uh, online um, or offline. But again, the emerging evidence, which is inconclusive, shows that it could exacerbate loneliness, could make loneliness worse um, rather than better. And then finally, uh, the whole issue around bullying. We all know that um, bullying um, is pernicious. It's something which exists in... Uh, in all workplace sectors, it exists across all types of schools, across all types of universities, um, and it is the behaviour itself which is problematic, not the medium through which it is operated. You know, if there's bullying, prejudice, racism, sexism, homophobia, whatever it is, that behaviour, whether it's face-to-face -face or online, is problematic. But people can often feel even more empowered if they're sat behind a screen, if they don't actually have to uh, own what they're saying. And we know that there are a number of, uh, of people who, who sit behind you know, a false uh, picture and a false name um, and can behave uh, really, really appallingly. And I think the, the, the key thing really in relation to that is that, that we take our phones into our homes. Um, uh, some people take their phones into their bedroom. So places that might have been safe previously no longer feel safe because people are able to reach into those places through um, social media. So that's, those are the, some of the problems. But I think yeah, if I was to uh, really then think about when has it been a force for good, you know, we know that lots and lots and lots of people are able to get good quality information that they may not have had access to before. We know that people can create connectivity, they can create connections, they can create relationships, which they may not have been able to connect before. We know that they may have been able to seek help through an online forum, through peer support, through online chat, through social media uh, conversations that they may not have been able to help bef to co access before. And then we know that people with particular lived experiences or people with uh, from particular communities um, can connect with each other and can provide peer support um, and help and advice and guidance and, and understanding to each other um, in a way um, that they may not have been able to um, before. And our job, it seems to me, is to think about how do we amplify the positives and try and mitigate uh, the, the negatives. There is a danger when people are talking about social media that the medium through which the problems come becomes the problem rather than the problems themselves. So how do we make sure that we're really, in all that we're doing, amplifying the positive? And that means, yeah, people will... Um, I was reading as background, so if any of you are interested, the Centre for Mental Health um, has done a really good briefing about social media, young people, um, and mental uh, health. Um, and uh, one of the things that you think is really interesting is that quite often 
we talk about young people. Now, I'm not far off 50, and I recognise all of those things in myself and in my social networks um, as well. Um, and I think you know, we must all learn how to use social media properly. We'll often talk about um, young people must learn how to, but that abdicates the responsibilities about the culture which we create and the way that we are able to teach people. Where I do think we probably talk less uh, about is our brains um, were not designed to be switched on all the time. Our brains were designed to rest. Our brains had a fight or flight um, mode, which is about response to dangers. Um, and there is, a, I think, a, an increased danger that what digital and social media uh, does is <coughs> enables us to be on all the time or encourages us to be switched on all the time. And actually what that does is leads to burnout. It leads to you know, uh, uh, too much cortisol. It leads to us um, getting then overstressed about things which may ordinarily not cause us stress. So um, yeah, I was lucky enough the last three weeks I've been on two one week holidays and my challenge to myself was um, make sure that for most of the day, most days you don't look at your phone at all. Because you know, when I was a child, when you went on holiday, you know, people didn't phone the landline of the campsite or the landline of the hotel. You were out of bounds. Nobody contacted you. And you did have a different type of rest, a different type of relaxation. So if any of you um, have got summer holidays coming up um, and you spend a lot of your time attached to your phone, um, I would just encourage you to put it away in the morning. Um, my challenge, of course, was I didn't have a camera. That was, that was the key thing. You, I didn't have other things. So um, for my next holiday, I'm going to buy something which you can take photos on, which isn't my phone, because that's the only thing that I really missed as a result of it. So I'd encourage you all to think about how do you detach yourself from your phone? How do you allow yourself to look at the sky and think that looks amazing, rather than I'll take a photo of that so I remember it? Because that connectivity between your, your feelings and your brain and giving your brain a rest, I think is really, um, really, really important. So just gonna talk a bit about stress um, in the workplace um, for now, but I'm gonna get a little bit of you participating. Um, I don't expect you all to know the right answer, but I would like you all to put your hand up um, if you think it's true um, or false. So um, mental ill health costs the UK economy £34.9 billion pounds a year. Put your hands up if you think that's true. It's true. Those are the combined costs of staff turnover, which is £3.1 billion. Sickness absence, which is uh, £3.1 billion. Sickness absence, £10.6 billion. And reduced productivity, which is twenty-one estimated £21.2 billion. So those are all caused by mental ill health. So, next question. One in ten employees have been formally diagnosed with a mental health issue. Who thinks that's true? It's true. It's false. It's almost one in three people. Almost one in three people. So that's uh, the business in the community. So more people than one in ten. So, next question. Stress, anxiety and depression are the third biggest cause of sickness absence in our society. True or false? True, put your hand up. It's false, they're the biggest cause. So work-related stress, depression or anxiety accounts for 44% of work-related ill health and 57% of working days lost. That's according to the Health and Safety Executive, uh, com uh, health and Safety Executive last year. Um, next question. Suicide is the leading cause of death for men under 60 in the UK. True or false? Put your hand up if that's true. It's true. The leading cause of death for men under 50 in the UK. It's according to the Office for National Statistics. 5 0. 5 sorry. Zero, sorry. Okay. Last two questions. Last question. 40% of people with a diagnosable mental health, mental illness, receive no treatment at all. If you think that's true, put your hand up or false. So 40% of people 
with a diagnosable mental health issue, a mental illness, received no treatment at all. True, put your hand up. So who thinks it's true? Hand up? Yes. True. It's higher. It's 75% according to the Department of Health Chief Medical Officer report. So, we may be talking about mental health a lot. We may be talking about mental health a lot, but we've clearly got an enormously long way to go in order to um, address uh, that properly. So, what can we do to try and address that? I think the first thing to say is that clearly there are both organisational and personal responsibilities within it, and too often um, people will go straight to the personal responsibilities. But the key thing, of course, is that you know, we have to have jobs that are designed in order for us to be able to succeed. You know, so if a job is so um, big uh, that uh, even if you work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, then clearly that isn't setting you up for success in terms of mental um, health. If it's designed in such a way that you are unable to um, deliver the objectives for whatever reason, whether that's your skills, whether that's the resource, the capacity, um, then it's not setting you up um, for success. Good HR practices um, and good management practices, and we're, you know, I'm here um, you know, from uh, talking uh, as a companion of the Chartered Management uh, Institute, um, and good management practices you know, are fundamentally um, important all the time. You know, knowing what your objectives are, knowing what success looks like, giving good feedback, making sure that we're willing to have difficult conversations, modelling good behaviour, that's important all of the time. But there will also be life moments, whether that's um, you know, divorce, separation, moving to a new country, uh, bereavement, um, where you'll also need um, managers to be um, very, very good. Um, and then you may also um, be a manager or be a person who has lived experience of a serious um, mental illness or a, or a mental um, uh, disorder. Um, where that will need particular skills and the line management will need um, to really be able, your line manager or you as a line manager will really be able to draw on all of your skills and all of your expertise to be able to, um, to ensure that people get the right support. Just to go back to the last uh, session which we talked about, of course, um, digital should be an enabler. Uh, you know, email should help you do your work. Yammer and instant messages should be making things easier um, for people. And I think at the moment, um, that isn't always the case. Um, when I first started working, I didn't have an email address and people would um, send letters. So a letter would come and you'd expect to wait you know, three or four days before you got a response and then you might pick up the phone or you might write again. Whereas now we expect instant responses and if I was to you know, guess about out of every 100 emails, um, there might be 50 or 60, which is about somebody else asking me for something they want, rather than helping me to deliver what are my priorities. And, and we have to be clear and understand when it is okay to just ignore it, when you actually you just need to make sure somebody else deals with it, or when it's right and proper for you to do it, even though it may not have been on your list of things to do um, all day. And, and you know, I don't know about how many of you have something that slides in from the corner when you get an email or a notification on your Twitter account and a notification on Instagram and a notification when your mum calls and da 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 da. Mm. But actually I just say turn all of those off. You know, go to it when you're ready to go to it rather than go to it when it calls you. Uh, you know, both for your well-being but also for your productivity. Uh, you know, and and you know, email doesn't need to be turned on all the time. You, know, you can turn it on for an hour or for two hours and, and really do um, some work. I think it's also important for us to have a strategy for looking after our own well-being. Um, I've got holidays booked until uh, May next year, both so that they're booked in, so that they're in a clear, clear moment, um, but also because um, I have a partner who also wants to go on holiday and if a meeting comes in and it's so important and it's you know, not blocked off time, then I get you know, into difficult conversations at home 
as well. So those bits about what are your boundaries? You know, will you um, uh, uh, make sure that you don't do your emails on the holidays? Um, and even if you can't do those things for yourself as a line manager, um, the best thing that one of my team ever said to me was, you may go on holiday and think that you still need to do your emails, but I need you to know that your team need a break from you yeah. when you go on holiday as much as you need a holiday. So if you can't do it for yourself, do it for your teams to make sure that they get the break from you so they can get on with some of their work, that they don't feel as though you're constantly um, on the shoulder. And then thinking about self-care, um, you know, we people talk a lot about self-care and, and what it means, and it might mean a walk, it might mean swimming, it might mean talking to a friend on the phone. Um, I just encourage you to find something where you genuinely do not think about anything else. You know, where you are literally in that moment, allowing your brain to you know, enjoy the feeling of picking grass or, or whatever it is, but really just trying to make sure that your brain is properly having the opportunity to close down um, from work. So finally, how about putting um, mental health first? I think the first thing to say is it is a mindset, that sometimes people think um, high performing means not caring about people. Actually, high performing people are people who are cared for, who feel cared for, and who care for themselves. Because none of us are robots. We're human beings um, who need to rest. We're human beings who need to be able to um, uh, deliver, deliver well, and then you know, know that we've been successful so that we get the benefit from that, be able to learn from that process, and then to be able to move on to the next thing. So the mindset of good mental health means good performance is that if you remember nothing else from today, I would just say the two things go together. They're not one or the other. So putting your mental health first is a mindset. It means whatever you do when you're thinking about teams, about the way that we work, the way we do things, how will this help people to be well? How will this help people to deliver? How will this help people to um, ensure that they're able to be successful? There's a document which I'd encourage you to read, specifically in the workplace, which is called Thriving at Work. It was a review which was done for the Pri uh, Prime Minister by um, Stevenson and Farmer, um, and it sets out standards for um, promoting mental health in the workplace and ensuring that people with serious mental illness get the support that they need. Again, really, really encourage you um, to, to read uh, that. Um, talked about a strategy for well-being, and I, I really mean have a long, hard think. You know, if you're going into a role, how are you going to make sure that you look after yourselves and you look after your teams um, within that? Because then you'll be able to role model behaviours. You know, if your team see you working at 10.30 at night, if your team see you getting up at 6 o'clock on Saturday, if you see your manager working at midnight, those are things you think, this is what success looks like, this is what being good looks like, and it just sets yeah, a train. Just think about the things you can do to role model behaviours. Um, you know, if you're unwell and you go into work, all that you actually do is make yourself more unwell and your team unwell as well. If you stay at home for a day, you're more likely to be back at work the next day without having made other people ill as well. Yeah, so again, just thinking about that bit, if you can't do it for yourself, think about other people and the impact that you have um, on other people. I think at its heart, being uh, putting mental health first means, um, men yeah, mental health first means being human, um, being really alert to our team, making sure that we're thinking um, the whole time, um, making sure uh, that we're really um, able to uh, uh, have a whole organisation approach where you've got policies, practices which uh, enable people to know that you're thinking about them as people in, and people who you want to be able to do um, their best. Um, that all of us need to have a basic understanding around mental health, mental ill health and know how to ensure that that advice, uh, information, support, guidance um, is available, um, whether that's through the Employee Assistance Programme, through clinical support through social support that's available. Um, and really, really thinking about how do I, as part of a team, or um, as a leader of a team, uh, contribute to the emotional health, health and well-being um, of, my, of my team? You know, not letting things fester, 
thinking about, you know, could I make somebody um, uh, feel positive about what they're doing by giving them feedback? Am I noticing enough about the things which people are doing for me? You know, none of it is rocket science, but you know yourself how when you've done something, if somebody says thank you, um, we feel uh, uh, good about that. If somebody doesn't thank you, we're a bit like, oh, what's going on here? You know, so how do we make sure that we're being thoughtful enough and mindful enough about um, ourselves and the other people um, in the workplace? And I you know, think CMI um, is an excellent source of advice um, and guidance on all things to do with managers. If you, you know, use, it, like anything, you know, use the information which is available for you. It, other people have thought about these things. Other people have produced things which will help you to do it. There's a lot of tools on um, the Mental Health First Aid um, website, which is Mental Health First Aid um, MHFA England um, dot org, um, and um, you know, lots and lots of websites and information which will help you to to think about this so that you're not starting from scratch. So that's my. Um, just over 30 minutes uh, uh, presentation. Now an opportunity for you to ask me any questions. Thank you very much. Can I, can I just add that we've also got colleagues of Adobe Connect in different centres, so we've got some in Holborn, Manchester, as well as Birmingham. So we'll have questions from the Adobe Connect sessions as well. But can we first of all start with questions in the room? Who wants to know first? Just wondering, <coughs> I think it's really. So the question was about: um, Is it that the con uh, the, the um, definition of mental health is changing? Is it that people um, are classing more things as mental health than they were previously? Um, I think the short answer is that we're more aware. We are more aware about it. There, there's a greater understanding. Yeah, there is. Um, people have always. Uh, had uh, experienced stress, anxiety, mental illness. Whether we've talked about it, whether we've got help and advice for it, whether we um, have felt confident to go um, for information is, um, well, we know we haven't. We know there's an enormous amount of stigma. As we get better at communicating about that, stigma reduces, more people seek help and support. But you'll see from those really high figures that still too many people are not seeking that help um, and advice and support. And clearly, um, what people will uh, class as mental illness or what positive mental health looks like, whilst there is a universal definition set out by the World Health Organization, there will be an understanding about that, which is culturally specific and cultural context um, for that. But I think you know, we, we know that there is a there are greater pressures that people experience. Um, but we also know that there is a reduction in stigma in which that means there's an increase in asking for help as well. So um, uh, just a, a 
saying that actually there are lots and lots of pressures about emulating in the workplace, feeling as though you might need to work harder or not to be able to say I'm ill. And what we know is that people with mental um, illness will sometimes not want to disclose it because they're worried about the promotion, worried about getting access onto another project or knowing, thinking what will my colleagues or my manager think about me. So that stigma is still really there in the workplace. I'm going to paraphrase the statement, because I'm not, but um, came across a statement in medicine that uh, there is nobody that is healthy, they're just undiagnosed. And your question was whether I believe that's true in terms of mental health as well. So I think we all know that um, health and illness is on a spectrum. Yeah, and uh, you know, that somebody's broken leg, somebody's uh, unable to walk, somebody might have an ache in their leg, and it, physically you can define um, that. I think um, with mental health, yeah, there, are, there is clearly, um, there are diagnosable uh, mental um, illnesses, and those have clinical conditions which are experienced. Um, we might have a, a mental illness but be feeling absolutely brilliant emotionally at a particular time and unwell um, at another time. So I think, is, is it, um, I guess I'm slightly more optimistic in that I think that we have um, a spectrum. I wouldn't say that we all um, are unwell, either physically or, or mentally, um, but I think that we can do lots to look after ourselves. You know, exercise, sleep, what we eat, what we drink, um, what care we take of ourselves. You know, we, we know the things that keep us well, um, and yet, you know, myself included, we do all sorts of things that don't keep us as well um, as we might uh, need to. So I think um, I understand the essence of it. I don't know that I would agree um, wholly um, with, well, no, I wouldn't agree wholly with it because I don't believe that we are all just undiagnosed. Um, oh, I'm hearing them here. So the um, question was, did I say that if you spend too much time on social media, you're more likely to become unwell, because you develop mental health problems? That, um, I said that, um, I didn't quite say that, no. <laughs> and what I wouldn't want to say is at what point does it become a problem either, because I think that that's all context specific. Um, what I did say is what the evidence is showing is that there's probably about 5% of people um, young people specifically, I don't know that research has been done about adults because of course it's young people are the problem, not all of us. Um, and um, they uh, show that about 5% um, may have an addiction, which is deeply problematic and can cause problems. Um, what I said was um, our brains need to rest. That if we don't allow our brains to rest from whatever, whether that's social media um, or from um, the noise which goes on in our minds, you know, and we can sometimes work in order to reduce it, then we are more likely to feel anxious um, or stressed. You know, we need to find ways to ensure that we're able to, to relax, that we're able to take wherever we can. You know, clearly, um, not looking at Twitter isn't going to solve issues for um, everybody, but there, is a, there, is a, there are some things which we can do to try and help ourselves to, to be well or to be better. And thinking about our social media use is the important bit. Um, I, I, I don't know any evidence which talks about the... Uh, hold on one second, I can only hear one person at a time. What was your...
No, there isn't. What I would say is don't have a notification flashing up all of the time, which tells you everything comes on, because then you'll be on it, or then your brain is going, oh, there's something for me. It doesn't know that it's not a threat. You know, it just knows that there's something that you're alert to. So I would just say, whatever frequency you go on, however often, you choose when to go on. Don't let it tell you. Do we have any, any more questions? Is this about social media specifically? Yeah. Well, not just Bernard. Well, then there's other people that just... Well, just yeah, so I, I asked the question, because you said it would mainly the younger generation, and you said social media, you know, it creates pro uh, problems. And number one, five percent isn't really a, a big you know, population for that. Number two, also when you say, when you say this younger generation, it's not, we don't control ourselves and like, like when I was younger, I my mum would have had you know all she told me to she told me. I don't think you were in for the beginning of the presentation way when so I talked about it. Nice to understand that as well. Yeah, so I'll talk to you afterwards because I did talk specifically that it's not about the younger generation. Okay. So I don't want to repeat it now, but I'm really happy afterwards to have that conversation with you. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. somebody but also text is often a introduction into a wider conversation that sometimes it is um, uh, sometimes it is a text and it's contained in the text but often it will be a route into a, a bigger conversation I wouldn't say it's a sorry um, so I say it's progress that people who may not otherwise have talked previously actually now find text a, a route through which they are able to to get that help I know the answer to this, I wouldn't be sat here, I'd be some way making lots of money. Um, the, um, I, I think it depends, doesn't it? So um, it's the easy answer, and the answer which people often go for is, well, 
um, turn off your phone, turn off your computer, and that's clearly not something which um, uh, is possible um, for many people. Um, I think the only thing I can say is talk to someone you trust, uh, that whether that is a friend, whether it's a parent, a relative, a classmate, a manager, um, or a health professional, or, or somebody in a, a voluntary sector service. You know, we, we, bullying never goes away by not doing anything. It, it, it penetrates, it permeates, it's pernicious. And so the key bit is um, ensuring that um, talking to somebody who you trust um, or texting some, a service that you trust in order to try and um, address it and find strategies that work for you. There isn't any one way um, that, that works. You know, for some people, if it's on Twitter, muting people means they don't see it and that's enough. For other people, um, they know it's happening even though they're muting people and that causes problems. And so I think it's just finding um, ways to, to ensure that you can take a step, whatever that first step is. Now we have another question from Bonal. Uh, with the rise of mental health, sorry, with the rise of mental issues, would it be best to revisit treating mental health without medication? Um, so the implication of that question is that uh, lots of work doesn't happen without medication. So you know, we, we know that medication works for some people and is really important for some people. Um, we know that lots of people manage um, mental health conditions um, without medication. Um, and the important bit is ensuring that uh, a, a health professional, a professional is working, um, doesn't think there is only one solution, that there are a number of different solutions. But I would, I would just say there is nothing wrong with medication if medication is a thing that works. It's making sure to find the thing which works for people. And you know, if we think specifically in the workplace, medication is probably one of the things that people don't talk about in the workplace, and I think we need to. I think this goes to, um, to the, the question about good management, um, but I think it's also to acknowledge that it isn't always easy. You know, that there are some times when people um, struggle um, to deliver what is required to deliver, and an organisation's responsibility um, is to make adaptation where it can make adaptation to um, duty of care to the individual, um, but also to deliver what the organisation needs to deliver. Um, and so the most important bit in that is, is the confidence and the courage um, and the openness to have um, the honest conversations, the, the conversations which lead to um, solutions which work for um, the employee and the business. You know, and, and, and those things sometimes um, are really difficult conversations, but that's the only um, uh, way. So you know, really, really, you know, the heart of it, there isn't a single answer except the, the, the good quality conversation and the willingness to be open. And that's often the, the, the bit that people are not open until it becomes a problem. And once it's a problem, then it's more difficult to reach uh, a good solution.